Hello, welcome back to the channel. So this is part two of the Tamiya 251 stroke nine. So that's SDKF said 251 at stroke nine. So this is the Canon version or the Canon and Wagon, Wagon, however you like to, uh, however you like to pronounce it. So starting off with the tracks, rather simple here. It's just straight up uh, Tamiya XF72 which is that kind of brown colour, and then just brushing the rubber blocks with a rubber black colour. And now we're in for the main paint scheme. So I've sprayed the wheels as usual with rubber black, again, from Tamiya. And that's XF85. And now we're going to spray up the entire model in a flat, in, in, a, in a base coat of Dunkelgelb. And for that, we're using XF88 from the new Tamiya range. So that's dark yellow too. And I'm just showing you here that i am basically got everything glued on. And I know I've painted up the tools there, but we're just going to spray over everything and not worry about it. I was going to do it separately, but there's so little amount of stuff in this. It, it just made sense just to spray it up. So using the trusty wheel masks. Now, people do ask me where I get the wheel masks from. Uh, I've got one from Royal Model, which is out of Italy. Very old. I got this uh, probably 15 years ago, but it is still available direct from Italy. So that's Royal Model. Um, and then I've got a couple you can just see off screen, uh, orange ones, which are just circle templates. So basic stationery, that sort of thing. This is the Royal Model one, and this is based on models at the time. So it's a lot of Tamiya, early Dragon stuff and the wheel the holes are sized to the wheels and then these are a bit more generic these circle templates but it, one way or another you can usually get somewhere between the three and just to show you, this isn't how i do it i'm usually holding the wheel uh, but for the purposes of filming i've had to do it like this and even then you can't really see because it's very difficult for me to angle everything but you pretty much put the circle over which masks the rubber and gives you a nice sharp edge and it's as simple as that. So just uh, repeat. And go on up through all of the wheels. Now, we're going to have to do camouflage. And that's the first time, remarkably, that we have done camouflage on this series. It's taken a while to get there. So that really boils down to needle size. So with camouflage, if you can mask, doesn't matter what the needle size is, uh, what we're going to be doing here is a freehand camouflage albeit one that you could mask if you wanted to. So if you don't feel like spraying freehand is something you're capable of at the minute or want to learn to try to be, you can simply just mask this off with uh, rolls of white tack, make them into sausages, much like I've done in a lot of my aircraft videos, and you can mask off areas. Uh, and so in this instance, you would have sprayed the green, then you would mask just the small blobs of green off and then spray the rest in the base coat. You basically, in the, um, when you're doing that kind of masking, you're, you're always masking the smallest amount of camouflage. So this is the paint we're gonna use, is the dark green two, which is XF89. And then just to show you for completion, there is the XF90, which is red brown two. Those three colors make up the late war German camouflage of Dunkelgelb. Oh. Dunkelgrün and Rotblün, <laughs> something like that. And uh, just showing you those colours there. So this is the brown. A lot of people say the brown's a very weird colour. When it's on the vehicle, it looks absolutely fine. So, spraying freehand really boils down to two things. The size of the needle, three things. The size of the needle, air pressure, and thinness of paint. So, in this rather long-winded visual representation that I've got going on here, I'm going to show you how to, what the sort of consistency of paint you need. Um, it's all very well saying the consistency of milk. Um, that doesn't mean anything. It means nothing to me, the consistency of milk. I don't, you know, I don't know how to achieve that. It's not practical, is it? Saying, you know, I'm going to make something the consistency of milk. It's, it's not, it's just not something you can measure. So really what you need to do is thin your paint, have a test, lots of testing. You'll see other modelers, unless they're experts or they choose not to show you on film, um, often there will be paper 
all the way around where they're modeling and you'll see lots of splodges of the camouflage color so i'm using lollipop sticks here but believe you me as we get into it i have no end of problems but what i'm doing here is i'm gradually thinning the paint checking the pressures seeing how i feel uh, now i could tell you what i'm spraying at the pressure the thinness how much i've put in there but it's not really the point um, you need to get there yourself you need to get a feel for it so we're under 20 you know 20 psi we're more down between 10 15 psi and you just need to thin the paint until it feels right if you go too far you'll get something called spider webbing which i get and you're starting to see it now when we when we come on and when we we come off of the color you get like a splodge and that's almost too thin and also it's got too much high pressure so if you have high pressure also with too thin you'll get spider webbing as soon as you approach the model with the paint it will just splat out and you'll get like a webbing effect go too far the other way same again high pressure or low pressure if the paint is too thin you'll get lots of spotting uh, you won't get a clean edge now i settled for something that i liked here it was getting a little bit of overspray and um I think most people wouldn't worry with what with what I end up here. Most people would be happy, I believe. But I don't like overspray. I like to get a very nice tight edge. And that's what I was going for. It's regardless of whether I can put up with it, that wasn't what I was intending. I didn't want a feathered... Well, I didn't want an overspray edge. I wanted, I wanted a tight feathering. So that's what I keep going for. And that's what I do. So I had no end of trouble. You've got the good bit. But after this, you'll you'll notice that we don't spray the whole thing up. This is rather a short piece, actually, because it went on for about two hours. Uh, I was getting problems with the paint coming out. I you know, I could pull the trigger back and nothing was happening. That really boiled down to having a dirty clean brush. I should have... A uh, clean brush. A dirty airbrush. I should have cleaned it. I should have blown it through. I should have cleaned the needle, cleaned the nozzle, cleaned everything through. And I didn't. And I've even done a video on this telling you that you should do that. So... Um, I got no excuse uh, and after this I did clean it tried it again no issue so that's one thing make sure you've got a very clean airbrush make sure that the needle isn't bent that you've got no problems like that make sure you're getting good air feed make sure the paint's thin enough and if it if all of those things are right here you go spider webbing see too thin too close too much pressure it just splatted out although in my defense what you've just seen there was none of those things it just decided to fire out for some reason after nothing coming out now if that happens the reason i filmed it if you get something like that happen which will happen just leave it don't touch it do not touch that until it is completely dry because we're using lacquer thinners here even if you were using other thinners if you try and wipe it off you'll make an awful mess you can see it's still there in the in the left hand corner i'm carrying on and ignoring it and we come back around and once it's dry then you can just lightly sand it and just spray over it and it'll be gone. Um, but if you try and rub that away, you'll have no end of problems. You will wipe all the paint away underneath. You'll have a great big divide in the non-painted and painted area and you'll get loads of problems. So just leave it. Um, and here you can see I'm starting to get my eye in now. So with this bit that we're doing here where I'm spraying, it's very, very thin. Lots of tiny little lines building it up and it looks obviously quite see-through. And that's how you want to do it. If you just sort of build up sort of circular motions in that area you'll start to get the the coverage and then you're somewhere where you want to be so i carried that on around the model and i think this is what i was saying earlier i think most people doing their first couple of camouflage trials would be very happy with that and you absolutely should be because i knew i this is me <laughs> going over the top i knew that once that was completely weathered you wouldn't see any of the things that i was not worried about you can't see it on standoff scale as well as they say you know if you stand back can you see any of the problems no but if we zoom in with an hd camera you can see it's just a bit too much for me that camouflage just a bit too much overspray so um same old thing you know I, I know the answer here i've done it a million times i know exactly what to do but i did have to walk away from the model and think right what what's gone wrong here it kind of deflated my uh, uh day a little bit and that will happen and 
just walk away, make a cup of tea, look out the window, listen to the sound of the wind, watch the rain come down, and just realise that there's more to life than making your half-track look good. But then we can come back and we can use a tried and, tried and tested technique that's as old as scale modelling itself. But we'll do that next because we've just seen what frame we're in now. So the first thing you want to do is have a little go at sanding. Now what i got here is some fantastic little things that uh, Flory models have made. Good old Flory uh, out of UK. I think you can get these worldwide. Uh, so it's florymodels.co.uk and this I believe is his green and white sander, does he call it? There's nothing else like it in the range. What this is, is a kind of felt, which is what's touching the model at the minute, with flecks of metal in it. And it's designed just to, well, I think it was designed for if you've got gloss, a glossy finish, you should be able to mat the model down. I think that was the idea behind it. I kind of lost what, why it was there, but that's besides the point. So what you can do is actually lightly sand through paint layers. And then the other side, the white side that you can see there is a buffer. So that will buff it. So you can actually get a dull finish, or a shiny finish. That buffer will buff things to quite a high polish. This is one of the older ones I've swapped out now. And what I've done is gone around the green and just slightly sanded it away and you can see the shiny marks in the light and that's where I've buffed it as well. Already instantly better. Much happier with that. Much happier with that. Now I'm going over with a 1500 and be warned, this 1500 is a well-worn Infini stick at 1500 it's probably more behaving more like 2000 to 2500 if you were to get a brand new 1500 stick out of the packet you might find it will eat through the paint a little bit more than what it is here so do test things don't just assume because something i'm doing this is a two-year-old sanding stick so i mean it you know it's well worn is what i'm trying to say so i know and i know the feel of it and you should try and get the feel of your tools as well and you'll start to know they um they get a personality. They, they take on their own kind of character, I suppose, and you get a feel for it. Now, when all that's done, you can use the very old method, which is as old as the hills of spraying over the camouflage with the base coat colour. And that will tone down the camouflage. This is excellent for free tone camouflage, but it'll work here. So what I'm doing, as well as going over the entire of the green, you can also cut in and around the uh, the overspray as well with the base colour and it will start to tone it down. But what that does instantly is gives that green a muted colour and it makes it look brilliant. It ties it in, it makes it look worn, it makes it look aged and it instantly gives you that flavour of some of the models that you see around and you start to think, yeah, that's what I want it to look like that and then you start to see it. And what we had before was too much of a high contrast. And if you really want to know... How to sum this up, this is a filter. It's the same as your MIG washes, it's the same as an oil wash, this is a filter. You are now looking at the green through a layer of the yellow paint. So it's filtering the green and it's making it look less contrast and tying it in. What I'm doing slightly off camera here is just trying to cut in around some of the camouflage. Now much happier, this was all in the same day and by the evening I, I thought yeah there you go, you know learnt something, reminded myself of something, should I say. You know, this is this is old, old methods. I, 90s, 80s, you know, as soon as people started airbrushing, they were doing stuff like this. So just showing you the decals there. These are straight out of the kit. Uh, perfect candidate to spray them, but we're not going to do that. We're just going to cut around the carrier film. Very old decals. By that, I mean the older style, so they're very thick. They're not like the newer Tamiya decals. However, this boxing is probably, you know, not very old. Uh, they keep churning these out. So I'm not going to use a gloss coat here. And we're using very matte paint because it's the flat paint from Tamiya. And all I did there was went over with a sanding stick. A couple of those light buffing sanders. Now, I'm not buffing them to give them a gloss finish. Don't get confused in thinking that gloss, a shiny finish, is what you need for decals. It certainly helps. And um, in... It, it, well, it helps if you don't care and you just want the decals to go down. You don't want to worry about it. You just want to paint, gloss, decal, 
weather, gloss, etc. It works for that. It does work. Uh, but if you want to try and get more of a refined finish or a more of a delicate finish and not so many layers, all you need is a smooth paint coat. It doesn't need to be gloss. It can be matte. It can be gloss. It can be either. Just make sure it's smooth. And all I did there was not trusting my um, airbrushing. That's just sanding the one of those rough layers down a bit and it's just smoothing it out. But this is not a glossy finish. This is a matte finish. So just bear that in mind. Um, and the idea, all we're talking about is trying to avoid silvering. And, and the main reason I've done it, uh, avoided silvering, is by cutting around the carrier film in the first place. So um, that's a good way around that. But smooth paint will get you there as quick as anything else will. So it's one thing to aim for, for a smooth paint finish. And you can do it by using uh, you know, self-leveling lack of thinners very fine um, paint layers so building up the coats very slowly and gradually sanding back buffing down you know all of these things don't just hose it on and and think it's going to be smooth because it probably isn't um it's refinement i guess is what we're aiming for so now moving on with the decals on uh, not glossed i don't think i did anything actually i think i just put uh a setter on them we're getting the wheels on. Now these wheels are movable uh, on both axes. They, they turn around and also the suspension works. Um, so we're sticking with that because it's not causing us any problem at the minute. And I'm just gluing those on now and that will leave them workable. Just with Tammy are extra thin. We can pose them and it's, you know, it's always nice to spin a wheel, I think. I think we can all agree, agree on that. Nothing quite like it. Kind of hoping I do it here. Surely. No. 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 Ah, oh, well, I hoped I would have. So, just lining up those wheels. And what we want to do is make sure they're glued straight. So, as you look at them, they're straight on. Um, and level. And then we can make sure that they're actually touching the ground nicely. Put a bit of weight on them with that with the actual weight of the model and that will help them set and there you can see that camouflage really nice I like that finish I always have it's a bit more of an old school technique I guess guys are doing it a bit differently these days um, but I really like it it's I come from the Tony Greenland sort of age of uh, armour modelling and uh, actually that book is what inspired this um, this series if I'm honest And um, I like to try and build models for this. And I've got to be honest, through this entire build, uh, Tony Greenland's Panzer Modeling Masterclass from uh, Osprey Publications is the, the only thing I was looking at. I wasn't building this to make it the most accurate in-scale model. I was building this to build a model of a, of a model I've looked at since I was about 14. And... Um, it just really captured the reason for doing it. And there's no problem with that. You know, you've got no end of modelers these days. You know, you've got the Adam Wildlers, the Mike Rinaldis, the Night Shift. They're all out there. They're all doing their own thing. Um, albeit a similar style of, of, of stuff. You know, it's all, all tends to be we're moving to... A different style but it's all in the same pocket you know you've got mig as well they're, they're all the same type of finish and it looks absolutely great it's more realistic than it's ever looked you know models that look were being finished in the 90s didn't look anything like that and didn't have a hope of looking like anything that's being finished these days but there is still a place i feel for um i suppose this is like a nostalgia build i guess you know um so it's it's interesting, and, and you want to take, well, personally, I think you should take inspiration from all kinds of different uh, realms and uh, interests. And I can guarantee you, watching some of Night Shift's videos, he's uh, he's got the Tony Greenland uh, Ma Patterns of Modeling Masterclass book somewhere in his stash as well. Because I see a lot of you know a few of the old techniques as well creep in, which is absolutely great. It's you know it's great to see certainly on someone who's got that amount of reach. So it's very good to see these older techniques coming through still with these m much more modern techniques as well. So um, 
don't be scared to look back as well as forward when it comes to modelling and, and getting some ideas because uh, it all adds to it. it, it, it variation, you know, it, it's all a good thing to have. So now we get into the uh, meat and potatoes of things and, and we're getting the tracks on. These five pound tracks, I've said five pounds, I actually paid more than five pounds for them. And it was a very cheap place that had them for five pounds. So sure, let's let's bump that up and say you should be able to get them for around ten pounds uh, delivered. Hobby boss. Now I've got them on, and it was as simple as wrapping them around and putting the last link on with the block to hold it in. And they're very tight, but it is the right amount of length. And as you can see, you get that nice track sag. Oh, they just look like rubber band tracks, but that's not a problem because they're movable and they've got the right profile. So now we're just gonna wedge in a few bits of tissue to get our sag that we want. Again, you know, as old as the heels, this uh, technique. Once you've got the tissue in there to wedge it down, we can then just tap around with some plastic glue because they're plastic tracks. It's one benefit over metal tracks. And um, just glue them in, and once the glue's set up, you're away, you know, and it's absolutely fine. So, now, unfortunately, with the, I won't say demise, but with the uh, difficulty of finding truly modelismo tracks, um, plus the price, I don't know, you know, these kits, I, you know, I don't want to sound like a, <laughs> a bit of a cliche, so, uh, you know, a moaning modeler, but blimey, some of these kits, you know, you're already paying 30, 40 pounds for them, and then, you know, a set of tracks is another 30, 40 pounds, it starts to get a bit uh, hard to swallow, I think. So if you can pick up some plastic tracks or get some stuff that actually works, uh, it's, as far as vinyl tracks, you know, ones that you can get away with, I think it's well worth doing. Uh, and maybe sell the metal track, save the metal tracks for some of the uh, the more show-stopping builds you might want to be doing, just something to think about. Uh, of course, you've got plenty of money to spend on the hobby, you know, have at it. Uh, but yes, yeah, so fr Fruly model tracks are now um, direct only. So I think that's a little bit of a problem for us in the UK currently, not to get political. But um, you've got to order them direct from somewhere in Eastern Europe. Might be Ukraine. I think it is Ukraine. I hope it is. Well, it's good to find alternatives. And this Hobby Boss set is a good alternative. Unfortunately, there, it's a very limited range. Uh, this is kind of the best thing in it, to be honest. Uh, there's a set of King Tiger tracks as well, which is for a very unique version of the King Tiger. So we'll, we'll see. I'm sure someone's going to turn up with some plastic tracks or more availability of existing tracks, i.e. Uh, AFV Club or um, Royfield Models for Tigers and that sort of thing. Now, as we've got the stuff out, uh, the stuff, as we've got the tissue out, there's a little bit that didn't take and it's not quite sitting right, so we just repeat again. So just push a bit more in, just to get it down to where we want it to be. Get that sag right, make sure those tracks, heavy tracks, we can't lift up tracks. If we tried, you wouldn't move them. They're really, really heavy. So you need to replicate that weight by making sure they're touching at every point where they would touch and only raising up where there's a, there's a span. And then that weight again gives you the sag. And as you can see there, around the idler, perfect. Really happy with that. So now we've got the uh, muffler, which is another iconic part of the 251. It's just sitting there. Uh, it sits in nicely. I've sprayed the top, but hand brushed the uh, bottom bit. Same same paint, it doesn't matter. It'll, we'll sort it out with pigments. And just gluing that in. And now we're approaching what I think is most people's favorite part of the build. Uh, is weathering. Before that, we're just going to have a little look around the model, finish off any of the hand painting that we have to do, namely these tools up front here. Uh, so same old thing is painting the metal parts. I start with rubber black from Tamiya, so just XF85. Paint them in as best you can by hand. Paint the wood with desert yellow. So where we've used XF88, we'll use XF60 for the wood. Just give a bit of a different tone. And then use the oil method of, of weathering them. Now, just showing you sanding sticks there again. Uh, I believe I have only added 
a mat coat over these decals, ready for weathering. And now I'm just trying to sand that back a little bit where the thickness of the decal is showing through because we haven't got enough layers. Just trying to blend it down uh, at the sides, which it works fine, it's, it's no problem. Interestingly, the internal part of the four still has the carry film in it. It's not really worth cutting that out, I would say. So now we've uh, got that roughly sanded back and looking the part and just check you know the sheen and make sure everything's okay doing it again the other side for completion and then we're into the weathering so first off we start things with a pin wash and for that it's mixing up the oils so I'm just going in with a kind of dark brown wash I'm just hitting the recesses there and letting it run through um, this is raw umber, I would think, but any of the dark browns down around that sort of, you know, raw umber, uh, burnt sienna, I believe, burnt umber, uh, no, burnt sienna, I think is a bit more orange, uh, but yeah, so any of the dark browns works really well, and of course you've got all the modelling, uh, variants and versions, you could also be using an enamel wash at the same time, doesn't have to be oils if you don't like them. Uh, it's mainly the same thing, but we are trying to avoid acrylic washes. Now you'll find it being a light colour that the, the washes will cut through more effectively. So now to mix things up, as we did in the T34 video, we're experimenting a bit more with pigment. So once the pin wash is on, there's no sealing gone on here, straight in with pigments. So I'm just using the uh, MIG, the sort of older version of MIG, and um, just using... European Earth in here and that's just it's just the right tone for European Earth funny enough uh, so yeah that works really well we're getting that in all the nooks and crannies letting a little bit go up the sides as well we're going to show this one a little bit worn uh, no idea where it is I don't think there was a lot of information it could be maybe it's not even a, a, a specific vehicle 534 but we're just going to go at it like a well-worn mid 44 late 44 going into the winter that's the idea behind it with the box art of it being painted up now i was going to do the figure and i was going to do a little vignette of him painting it up but i i just could not get my head around why he would paint a vehicle that is dirty if you're gonna stop and whitewash a vehicle it probably means you haven't got someone right on your tail so if that's the case you're usually not very far away from a river. So my understanding would be if I was going to paint a vehicle in the middle of World War II and it was nearly winter and no one was chasing me and I had at least an hour to do it, I'd probably just walk down to the river and get a bucket of water and chuck it over. So for that reason, I thought, well, if we were going to do it, we wouldn't want to weather it. And I didn't want to miss out on the weathering. So we're doing this just before. That's the idea. Now, something I thought we'd go a little bit wild with, um, and I'm not sure if it's a good thing to show, but it's what I did anyway, is started gouging <laughs> scratches out of the side of the model. Uh, now, this isn't as drastic as it looks. It's, it's a very blunt end of a non-sharpened pencil. I'm just putting scratches in it. And I think what this is doing is cutting through the first layer of the green paint as much as it is actually just adding a shiny streak to it I don't believe it's actually cutting through the paint when you look at it I think it's just putting a little bit of patina on it's cutting through whatever was there the pigments and um, just giving a little bit of a high shine in areas and don't do this over decals because you'll catch them and rip it but you can do it through a paint surface that's, that's well and truly dried it does give a nice effect I don't mind it I think it's reasonably okay here and there. Um, I wouldn't be able to do it as nice as this with a paintbrush. So, it, you know, I just sort of stumbled across it and went with it, turned the camera on and thought, let's, let's go for it. I'm trying to kind of bring out some patina here. Um, and what I mean by that is if you think you've got a dusty vehicle, it, it, where I work, we've got tractors, the same things happen. You know, if you've got a muddy end of a tractor, 
it's muddy, but you jump up on it and you stick your hand on it and you'll notice that you do that all the time. You have like a shiny spot as well as you have dull spots and then you put diesel in it and you pour it down the side because you're not really paying attention. That will be shiny for about a month and on it goes. So I'm just trying to capture that, the idea of that. And now we've got the dust and the oils and the basic weathering on, just trying to cut back through that now and adding in patina using different things. So cutting back through the pigments to give higher shiny spots, duller spots, fuel stains, whatever, you know, crew marks. Uh, those doors, I guess, have opened quite a lot. So we've got a little bit of chipping around the top of there. And that's all I'm doing, just working around, just thinking logically about it and sometimes not logically, uh, but trying to do it all in, in tune with itself, if that makes sense. Nothing should look too out of place. I'm going around the whole vehicle, including the rear, getting everything ready, and basically just getting everything ready for the finale, which in this one's going to be the splattering, so mud effects, you know, of, of chucking up mud at the back and up the sides. Which is one of those techniques where I was talking about going back to the Tony Greenland side of things. He never, team, he, he never finished his models like this. They, they were finished for show purposes, and I mean by putting on a shelf and looking nice. So not quite die-cast, but certainly not heavily weathered. Uh, the only time he, 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 he writes about it, the only time he ever attempts to put mud in is if it's going to be on a diorama or, or on a base. And that's fine. You know, that's absolutely fine. But these days, things do seem to be all about the weathering. And for that, we're going to chuck on pigments, we're going to chuck on oils, and we're going to make this look nice and worn. And the same thing's applying around the front. So now, just with these enamel panel liner washes from uh, Ammo, which are great, they do... it. What it's doing there is not where I put it. You can see it wicking, and that's soaking into the dry pigments around it. And that's a great effect, because when it dries it sort of dries back and it looks just like it would if you had a dry muddy vehicle that went through a puddle and it was how it would look the next day you can see now how we're really starting to build something up around the front there it's starting to look really nice on the right hand side i have unfortunately pinged off the width indicator still to this day it is missing i'm certain it's going to turn up however we have totally remodeled the room since and it still hasn't turned up so you know, things are getting a little bit more drastic in that side of things. But nevertheless, it's um, it's coming together okay. Uh, maybe these width indicators do break off. It doesn't look good. I'd much prefer it to have it there. So now into the splattering technique. This is, again, simple, as old as the hills. Any thin wash, oil, enamel, whatever it is. Uh, not acrylic, again. That could be my new uh, saying not acrylic but what you do here is just load up a brush flat brush thick brush whatever you want and just flick it off of something i was using a cotton bud not so good with the paper uh, so i switched to a cocktail stick and that was giving me the uh, rigidity that is what i wanted to give the right splatters you'll see here i got a bit of a heavy heavy amount hit that there which actually then worked in my favor because it reminded me of something else i wanted to do was to have crew marks you know scuffed marks getting in and out these doors at the at the back so that works quite well um should be at the openings i think i do get there in eventually but yeah i thought we'll just plaster this on because like i said it's mid to late 43 44 i think i said 44 earlier it would be a bit late in the game for the germans i think better run this at 43 to 44 and um anything goes really you know it'd be very muddy I, I, i'm thinking eastern front and not to forget the front and you can see on the paint pot there what it does it, it, it <laughs> certainly makes a mess i can tell you that it does make a mess but it does also give a very good effect. So don't do this on your best uh, dining table or in the, you know, the living room or make sure there's some stuff down because it goes everywhere as well. I mean, you want a good, I don't know, a lot. Like a good A3 cutting mat and even then you'll find it on the edges of it. So uh, be warned. But I really just 
get all of this in and around that front end on the underside of the fenders, behind the wheels, at the side of the wheels, on the front of the wheels, on the tread of the wheels, everywhere. As it would be, you can imagine. No, I really like the effect. I think it's great. I really was quite happy with it. I'm not tooting my own horn thinking this is the, be you know, the best thing you're ever going to see. But for what I was doing, I was really happy with it. And there's no problem being happy with your model. It doesn't have to be... You don't have to have other people thinking that. As long as you're happy. That's why we're here. We're not, you know, we're not doing it for anything else. Especially as there's no shows or anything around at the minute. Um... So do remember to have fun. It is a hobby. We shouldn't uh, get stressed out by it. I'm a little bit not annoyed. Um, I feel like I lost sight a little bit in, in getting rather downbeaten by the uh, camouflage not working well. So you've got to remember that um, a lot of this doesn't really matter. It's, it's all about trying things. That's the whole emphasis on this series is trying new techniques in getting to the end and moving on not thinking this is the most precious thing i'm ever going to build because it's not going to be you're going to build something else so you know get this one done get it out of the way crack on with another one but enjoy the process and don't be scared to try te new techniques now i think this is a natural kind of progression for the series where we've got to here and i'm going to change things as we go forward a little bit now mainly because it's an awful lot of work and editing for me to get these massive build videos out. So what I think I'm going to do is break it up a little bit and let some of the pressure off a little bit in the way of not thinking about having to do a complete build, then the weathering of a complete model and, and maybe try and now pinpoint on certain things. Just as you're seeing, crew quarters. So this is all spares, box stuff, just painted up separately and we're going to place it in and around the interior, make it look lived in. But for the series as we as we move forward, um, I'm going to do, for instance, next week, um, I did put a poll out and I think a uh, near clear winner was uh, more advanced building. So for next week, I've decided I've already got a tiger. It's built, but it's not painted. It's going to be the same scheme as the same paint, same everything. Now, I'm going to finish that build video off. I'm going to do it in one video, and then at the end, we'll have it spinning around unpainted so you can see it warts and all. Uh, but on that, I have used photo etched tool clamps. I've used 3D printed tool clamps. We've used Eureka tool cables, and I've drilled out in individual link tracks to give the guide horns the correct opening. <sighs> It's uh, better to not know something sometimes. So I think for all of that, we'll show you that in the next video. We'll talk about it more like a post-build review. But the second follow-up video will be coming some way down the line. So it won't be in two weeks you'll see it built and painted. So I think that's, that's fine. And we'll move forward and try and break it up a little bit with that. I'm going to do some uh, paint chipping. I'm going to do a whitewash, a bit of hairspray technique. Uh, so that leaves me a bit of time. I don't need to turn the camera off. I can just get a model built and painted. And if we're going to do a whitewash, for instance, spray it in the base coat, and then that's where we pick the video up. And then I can just show you that pinpointing certain techniques. So we're going to go through like that for a bit now. So hopefully you'll stay with me and you'll continue to learn and enjoy the series. And as always, I do thank each and every one of you for watching. Uh, we've got some patrons on the channel and some members on the youtube side on the channel who contribute financially to helping the channel grow and i uh, am very grateful to each and every one of you and i'm uh, uh, yeah you know, i really am humbled that people are happy to follow me in that way uh, the same goes for everyone commenting liking the video it goes a long way i do read all the comments i reply to most that are actual questions where i can so thanks for that and uh, do please continue to follow the channel as um, it's great. It's great to have a bunch of you out there who are following me on a weekly basis. So I'm going to continue with the weekly videos as much as I can. And I think breaking it up in the way I said is the best way forward for that. So as always, thanks for watching. Stay tuned. If you haven't already, please consider subscribing to the channel. Like the video if you do so. If you want to help out the channel, there's a few ways you can do that in the description box below. And again, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.